To defeat an enemy, you must know them. The galaxy far, far away is not all war. Indeed, there is room for peaceful pursuits. A healthy culture of arts, games, and entertainment thrived alongside even the darkest days in the shadow of war. While all worlds had a culture unique to their populations and life forms, some activities became universally practiced and recognized. While subcultures existed, some transcendent art forms contributed to something resembling a mono or mainstream culture of the galactic diaspora, regardless of a species origin or homeworld. You are listening to the Star Lore's podcast. <laughs> Toshi Station to pick up some power converters. I got a bad feeling about this. The Arts. The Arts can take many forms. From tangible to abstract, material to digital, performative to tactile, and can be appreciated by or in defense to one or any of the senses, including those past the most commonly recognized by human biology. Because of the sheer infinite ways of artistry can be expressed, it would be a fool's errand to even attempt to list them all here. But these, and no doubt many, many more, remain undescribed but fully appreciated in the galaxy. Sculpture A traditional form of carrying a three-dimensional representation of a subject using any number of materials, including marble, sand, wood, ice, or clay, among almost any other material capable of holding a form. Sand casting was a prevalent art form on the planet Tatooine. During the Clone Wars, a Tatooine sand castling valued at 2,500 credits, which depicted a Tusken Raider in battle and it was stolen. The artwork was taken to a hotel room in the Starlight Lounge on the planet Genarius by the minions of the Rodian slaver Gomalo. These sand castings were seen as unique conversation pieces by members of the Imperial upper class. Bass Relief An ancient form of art where the subject protrudes slightly from the surface from which it is carved, adding a three-dimensional effect to an otherwise flat image. The Great Hyperspace War Bass Relief, originally a Masasi frieze, was unearthed during an archaeological expedition on Yavin 4 led by the Wolhanian Expedition. Great Hyperspace War Bass Relief This relief portrays a fierce battle from the Great Hyperspace War, depicting clashes between adherents of the light and the dark sides, accompanied by various war beasts. Jedi visitors initially interpreted the artwork as a gesture of respect toward their order, but it was covertly communicated Palpatine's conviction of Sith supremacy. It was notably owned and displayed in the office of Chancellor Palpatine during the waning days of the Republic and dating back to 3,678 BBY, a rendition of this artwork adorned the walls of the Sith Emperor's chambers within the Dromund Cass Citadel in Cass City. Nearly 4,000 years later, following a duel on Yavin 4, Massa Meta was dispatched to the moon to procure the frieze alongside piranha beetles for Chancellor Palpatine. By the aftermath of the Battle of Yavin 19 years into Palpatine's reign as Emperor, rumors had widely spread regarding his possession of this vast relief. Man in Carbonite Another notable bas relief, if it really qualifies as such, 
is the Man in Carbonite, which was the moniker bestowed upon Han Solo by Boba Fett after Darth Vader transformed the smuggler into a carbonite block in 3 ABY. Vader entrusted the sculpture to Boba Fett, who sold it for 250,000 credits to Jabba the Hutt. More than, and in addition to, the 100,000 credit bounty initially placed on Solo. The Man in Carbonite met its demise when Princess Leia Organa liberated Solo. A faithful replica of this iconic artwork was featured on the Skywalker tour of Jabba the Hutt's former palace. This finely rendered carbonite sculpture, the person of Han Solo. No, what I brought to you today is art, art created by the Dark Lord, that happened to use Han Solo as material, like another artist might shape clay. Quote, Boba Fett. Aurelian Sculpture was the handcrafted artwork by the citizens of Aurelia on Dathomir, consisting of four sections forming the town's insignia. This symbolized the unity of the citizens as part of a greater whole. A complete set of these sculpture pieces was awarded to the four sensitive spacer for their role in defeating the Zabrak Dark Jedi, Melakai, following the Battle of Yavin during the Galactic Civil War. Hollow Sculptures a hollow sculpture, or hollow sculpt, was an art form where a sculpture was projected using a three-dimensional holographic medium, like a hollow projector or hollow plate. Eddie Orung was known for producing popular and dynamic hollow sculptures. Other variants of hollow traditional arts, including things like hollow murals, hollow tapestries that merged holographic technology with traditional art forms. Coral shaping, also referred to as coral sculpting, involved cultivating sculptures made from coral. This art was practiced by both the Mon Calamari and Corin species on their homeworld of Dak, as well as the Aquin of Lazarian IV. Garnib crystals were a unique sculpture originating from the planet Garnib. Crafting this crystal involved several meticulous steps, each performed by skilled artisans in specialized crystal factories. Initially, sculptors used sonic smoothers to carve the sculpture from a block of ice. Simultaneously, gem masters meticulously polished and engraved gemstones and glass with intricate designs. Next, the ice sculpture and prepared gems were brought to a crystal mill, where a thread master wove a molecular string interfaced with gemstone and glass fragments. This delicate thread was then sewn into the crystal's interior. The sculptor and gem master collaborated to embed full-size gems into the crystal. Finally, the completed crystals underwent inspection in a sonic bath by a team of artisans to ensure its beauty and value before being marketed to galactic crystal creations. Beautiful, aren't they? They're Corellian flame miniatures, one of that very short list of art forms which others have tried to copy but never truly been able to duplicate. Thrawn. Corellian flame miniatures were delicate light sculptures resembling floating glowing flames with a pinkish hue. Crafted by Corellian artists, they were made from transoptical fibers woven with pseudo-illuminescent plant materials and ghoulish light sources. Despite their simplicity, these sculptures were highly esteemed and never successfully replicated by other species, despite several attempts. Grand Admiral Thrawn of the Galactic Empire 
was an admirer of this art form. During his military campaign against the New Republic in 9 ABY, he surrounded himself with the holographic images of these miniatures to aid in his contemplation and reflections. Mosaics Mosaics are an art form and decorative technique that involves creating images or patterns by assembling small pieces of materials, such as colored glass, stone, ceramic, or other materials, called tesserae. These pieces are meticulously arranged and fixed onto a surface, often using a binder like mortar or adhesive to form intricate and detailed designs. The Alsakin mosaic were a magnificent mountain-scale artwork on the planet Alsakin, featuring gleaming tiles that radiated from a central square in the old city of Rukapar to the summits of five mountains. During the 14,450 BBY conflict, known as the Cleansing of Rukapar, part of the Third Alsakin Conflict, the centerpiece was destroyed. Despite this, historian Vicendi included the mosaics in the 20 Wonders of the Galaxy in 10,000 BBY. A replica of the mosaics was later displayed at the Fig and Associates Art Museum in Cloud City on Bespin between 1 ABY and 3 ABY. Brocken glass was a form of artistic craftsmanship. Reha Organa, the final queen of Alderaan, created a collection of Brocken glass, which her husband and daughter found displeasing. Theatrics, performance, and mixed media. They refer to live presentations of scripted or improvised works, usually performed by actors on a stage in front of an audience. These performances combine various elements of art and production to create a cohesive and engaging experience. The primary purpose of theatrical performances is to entertain, inform, or provoke thought and emotion in the audience. From the holovids showing pre-recorded dramas to the participants of Besson, theatrical performances were widespread across the galaxy. Farnican chime paintings blended musical, painting, and sculptural elements into mixed media artworks. Edel, a notable example, was believed lost but later retrieved from Mount Tantus following Grand Admiral Thrawn's downfall. Grass paintings were a unique form of art participated on the planet of Alderaan, where botanic artists used the vast flat grasslands as their canvas. Instead of traditional paints, they utilized flowers and the natural wind as their tools to create intricate designs. Artists seeking to create grass paintings needed to obtain a five-year license. The initial phase involved creating the artwork, followed by subsequent years where the painting evolved through collaboration with the environment. Mastery in meteorology was essential for these artists, despite the unpredictable nature of weather patterns and plant growth. One notable grass painter, Ab Kador, gained notoriety at Alderaan University for being a troublemaker. Upon learning of Emperor Palpatine's imminent visit, Kadar ambitiously decided to honor the emperor by planting hundreds of thousands of flowers, seeds to depict his portrait on the grass canvas, but making him appear aged and frail using black lilies spread across the image's face. When Palpatine arrived, he viewed the painting from a sail barge, accompanied by advisors and imperial guards. Kadar fled before the emperors retaliated against this artwork. He evaded capture despite a bounty placed on him. His whereabouts remained unknown, leaving his provocative artwork and its consequences a lasting tale on Alderaan. The written word. It can take the form of art in numerous ways, from novels to poetry to the writings of a song. The written word is newest of the traditional art forms, but still immemorially ancient. Snivians were known to compose trans novels. However, not much is clear about what they are or how they work. Photography, holovids, and image capture technology. 
Decelerated luminescent images were essentially frozen quantum condensate pictures of an Alhutta, preserved in time using protheum gas. Created by Gorgo the Hut before 419 BBY, these images became rare artifacts by 19 BBY. They were cherished possessions of the Hut crime lord Rocco, who greatly admired Gogo's tra craftsmanship. The protheum gas cooled to near absolute zero was incredibly dense. It slowed down light to such an extent that images captured through it could depict scenes from decades or even centuries earlier. However, due to its density, described as being light years thick, it posed a significant explosion risk if not handled with extreme caution during expansion. While this is certainly not an exhaustive list, there are also other art forms that are due their own episode themselves. Architecture is a notable functional and artistic discipline that at least warrants a mention, but is also a big enough topic to be covered on its own terms. Some blended art with architecture, like the ancient Sith, who were known for their ostentatious pyramids and great statues sculpted to immortalize the Sith Lords that had invariably been entombed on planets like Korriban. Similarly, dance and its many styles overlap with entertainment and will be covered later on. Arts and Culture Some worlds had a penchant for art and preferred it as an activity beyond other base systems of entertainment or had the luxuries of peace and resource stability to be able to focus on these pursuits. Notably, the planet of Alderaan and the Togruta species were known for their preference for peaceful and artistic pursuits. Other cultures would consider other forms of art as well. Warrior cultures like the Mandalorians or the Achani would find fighting itself to be a form of art or the craftsmanship of armor and weapons as fulfilling the same. For the Achani, fighting was akin to dancing. Strategy was also seen as an art form. The very art of war being something that generals and admirals would consider, such as Thrawn. Others, like the Wookiees, blended their signature art style into everything they did, including their basic technology as well as their war gear. Notable Artists Eben Q3 Baobab, or EQ3, was a polymath human scholar and artist renowned for his contributions to intergalactic communications, notably through his galactic phrase book and travel guide. Over 45 seasons with the Baobab merchant fleet, he explored 1,300 distinct cultures, enduring injur injuries and gaining wisdom. He also led the Baobab archives, a renowned repository of knowledge. As a member of the prestigious Baobab family, EQ3 was connected to the explorer Mungo Baobab. He excelled in numerous professions. Artist, art collector, writer, poet, doctor, merchant, philosopher, spacer, scientist, linguist, and philologist. And served as a war hero in the Kung Wars, the Ariel Plankton Uprising, and the Mora Infantry. Lieutenant Gela Riemann, a talented artist from Aldrag IV, gained interstellar fame before the Galactic Empire targeted her work, forcing her into exile and eventually to join the Rebel Alliance. Trained under renowned Empire artists, she returned to find her homeworld despoiled by military activities, including the construction of at, -AT and TIE fighter facilities that threatened local wildlife. After peaceful protests failed and she was arrested, Riemann covertly funded rebels and aided in sabotaging the TIE facility 
using her artistic skills. Captured and forced to create Imperial propaganda, she secretly provided vital schematics to the rebels, leading to the facility's destruction. Escaping Aldrag IV, she joined the Rebel Alliance as a supply pilot, later becoming a skilled X-Wing pilot. She fought in pivotal battles like Endor and Bakura, and after the war, trained pilots for the Bakuran Defense Fleet. Joining Rogue Squadron, she became a respected veteran, participating in missions during the Bacta Wars and celebrations on Coruscant. Now a word from our sponsors. So come on down to Jan K Speeder Rental on Duro, the best speeders this side of the galaxy. Welcome aboard the Millennial Falcon. This is Christian. And this is Jordan. We're just currently sitting and enjoying a beautiful operatic performance at the Coruscant Opera House. Generously sponsored by Damask Holdings, a notable patron of the arts here on Coruscant. Indeed. Great acoustics in this building, if I do say so myself. Um, anyways, uh, thanks everyone for tuning in to the best podcast on the Holonet. Also, I wanted to uh, just mentioned to everyone uh we did take a little bit of a hiatus the reason why we didn't have an episode for a little while is um i actually had a kid (laughs) my third yeah i was gonna say (laughs) not the only one yeah uh i did i did name him his his name is luke (laughs) a little nod to uh star wars uh, the wife wouldn't let me do Anakin, so we <laughs> had to, to do settle for something. <laughs> we had to settle for Luke. <laughs> but um, that's the, one of the reasons why we haven't uh, released an episode in a little while, but we're hoping to get back into the swing of things here. Um, Christian also has another one on the way, too. Yeah, so <laughs> hopefully that won't put too much of a dent in our schedule, but we'll see. Yeah, I think it's... Uh, what, when's that one coming? August. August, okay, yeah. yeah so we'll try and get a, at least a few out before. <laughs> yeah, maybe pre-record. <laughs> yeah, before. But anyways... Um, Baby's doing well, mom's doing well, so everyone's healthy. But uh, yeah, so we're back here, back in the swing of things. Um, also, just wanted to give a big thanks to one of our patrons who provided today's um, in-universe ad, TJ. He uh, record, wrote and recorded the Duro Speeder Rental ad. If you have an ad of your own that you'd like to submit, you can do it by giving us, you can submit a recording or a script uh, by DMing us on social media. You can find all our socials, um, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and Discord. Uh, if you just go onto any of those platforms and search Star Lords or Star Lords Podcast, we should pop up. Um, and then you can, or you can do email if you prefer that as well at the Star Lords Podcast at gmail.com. Um, also, want to be, do a big shout out to all of our new patrons. We're getting a bunch of you guys. Thank you very much. You're helping to keep this uh, bucket of bolts flying, <laughs> <laughs> so that it doesn't just, um, you know, Fall stall apart. in the middle of hyperspace, <laughs> hyperspace, and we get stuck in the middle of uh, nowhere. <laughs> yeah. Um, anyways, so big shout out to Devin, Joshua, One Nut, Nathan, Quentin, Justin, Ruben, Victoria, Zeph, and Ian. We very, very much appreciate all of the credits you send us to help keep the show afloat. Um, If you would like to financially support the show, you can uh, do that by going to patreon.com forward slash star lores. And we also will take one time donations on PayPal. Star Lores podcast at gmail.com is the PayPal destination. And if you wanted to send us a one time donation, tip or something like that you know i get it not everyone wants to be on recurring payments that's totally fine if you just want to show some love to the show you can do that also we have a big new announcement we have swag finally (laughs) finally (laughs) (laughs) we have an on it is live now we're going to start doing more posts about it uh, but we have some 
I I'm proud of uh, some pretty sweet um you know stickers, buttons, shirts, hats, that kind of stuff uh on Redbubble. So we opened up a Redbubble store with all the Star Lords merch. You can find that at star-lores.redbubble.com. We'll also include it in the link of the show, uh, notes. show notes here and um yeah, and you can go there and if you wanted to buy some merch, that would be awesome too. Finally um, rounded up a bunch of ugnots to get them to, <laughs> yeah. to work on this. So. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but, uh, you know, uh, y- if you don't want to support the show financially, totally fine. I get it. I listen to a lot of podcasts. I don't support all of them. Uh, not everyone can do that. But you know what really helps is if you share the show or rate the show on Spotify or Apple. That helps us um, get uh picked up by the algorithm and spread to more people um just yeah interacting with any of our content uh sharing the show in groups or with friends who may enjoy it also subscribe to our youtube channel that helps as well we have a youtube channel that you can sub to and uh that helps us grow the show so all those things can help if you want to help us grow this little project Christian, what are we talking about today? We are talking about, after all our shilling, is <laughs> art. <laughs> Some say we do this as an art, even podcasting. Indeed. I wouldn't be so uh, hubristic as to call this an art form, but, you know, some people might enjoy it mm-hmm. in that capacity. Yeah. Um, first, I just want to say that I just even love that Star Wars has this whole, like, art world. Um a little bit disappointed though when doing research kind of like when you a lot of star wars sub topics there's usually like a whole like it's like an iceberg right like yeah you, you hear a name drop or something mentioned then you dig into the iceberg and you're like holy smokes there's so much more information yeah. uh unfortunately in this case there wasn't a whole lot in the traditional arts or even in like the sci-fi arts i guess they're mentioned um but a lot of it depends on like real life things that we have things like mosaics and sculptures and that kind of stuff but when you get into the more like fanciful things it's usually just like a one word one off description of something and then it doesn't delve that deeply into it so maybe as fans we can come together and flesh that out ourselves (laughs) yeah yeah totally yeah things just like hollow sculptures like what does that entail? Like you can guess, obviously, that holographic technology is involved, but what does that actually look like? What does that actually mean? It's true. Is it even if it's just a hologram? Yeah, like is it just a is picture? That technically, a sculpture. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> or is that yeah, it's like your TV screen technically, or is this something that's like tactile? You can actually interact like, with. Yeah. Like who? Again, it's not. It's pretty vague. Yeah. Um. Same with like the Snivian trans novel. Is that's all I say? It's Snivians make trans novels, <laughs> but like, what is a trans novel? <laughs> Um, not a clue <laughs> yeah it's I, true it's sort of uh, yeah it's just left vague they try to make it sound sci-fi but yeah without any depth which is not characteristic of star wars typically but all that being said i do enjoy that there is this whole gamut of different art forms and artistry within the universe um and we'll delve a little bit more into some of the ones we didn't talk about things like dance and music and yeah. there, there's a lot more architecture um but they will all have their own episodes. Yeah, I mean, I do like, you know, you can take any of like the prominent uh, species or cultures and you could even just in your own sort of headcanon, you could make up ideas about how they would do things. Yeah, how yeah. they would do, you know, the Wookiees, it would be like a lot of wooden sculpture uh, or wooden carvings. Yeah, and, and there's some stuff that's like that's implicated, right? Like yeah. Wookiees, they use these like traditional wooden shields when they fight. Yeah, and, and armor. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And these are obviously like handcrafted, mm-hmm. like there's very intricate designs carved into them. Yeah. They are an art form, right? Yeah. So. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, one piece of art I wanted to point out in particular was the uh, hyperspace bass relief that we talked about that's in Palpatine's office there. Um, it's not very prominent. Um, it's not that you would notice it necessarily. You kind of see it in the background of any scenes that take place in Palpatine's office. And when he's talking with Anakin, you can see it in the background. Um, yeah, it's pretty risque to have Palpatine that just blatantly on display knowing... Well, us knowing that that like what it depicts, first of all, is the the great hyperspace war. But secondly, is the fact that it was probably commissioned by the Sith Emperor and held in his mm. his uh, 
palace. Yeah. And so it's just to have like it, it's almost like a big middle finger to the Jedi. Like I, I'm pretty open about who I am. You're dumb for not realizing it, right? Yeah, but you know, like at that time, to be fair, like at that time the Sith were like an ancient memory almost. Yeah, like, exactly. I wouldn't expect anyone to like yeah. pick up on it. People would be like, oh, he he has like, he's like a collector of ancient arts, you know, of which, our history. Which on that note does make sense. Palpatine is notable for having different kind of sculptures and pieces of art in his office. And, yeah. and his master, which people wouldn't have known was his master, but Hugo Damansk was a well-known patron of the arts and you know would visit the opera house and even had that special sky box um that's what palpatine uses with anakin their private box yeah, there yeah. um was a result of the De- hugo damask um sponsoring the opera house so yeah it's not like he wasn't known to be a collector of art and art always has that like element of like um sub- subversion or it can be used subversively so Palpatine kind of having that on display too is kind of like it's true intentional uh the funny thing about that bass relief too if you guys like go look at it online <laughs> it's it's just funny how it's like depicted almost like uh as primitive or like ancient greek art or something yeah. <laughs> when it's like they had literally hyperspace war <laughs> there yeah like, but i mean all of history is looked at like ancient <laughs> but they had spaceships yeah yeah i know but it's like why didn't they just have like a holographic depiction of it that's it? <laughs> actually true <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> i'm sure they had that technology sure. during the hyperspace wars but <laughs> yeah but if you i mean like the sith also built like big stone monuments right yeah like, that's true I think art could is, just be uh people are making bass reliefs today, right? Yeah, fair enough. Yeah. Yeah. Anyways. Um, that kind of leads me into my next question about art. This episode might get off the rails a little bit here, <laughs> as it does when we discuss <laughs> such subjectivities as art. Uh does bad art exist? And I'm not talking about bad as in the moral sense, but bad as in the um it's not good. <laughs> um and that that can be taken a couple of ways. Like, can art be bad? And like, is it strictly the art itself, or is it the content of the art? And this ties to my point about the bats relief is like the content of the art. It might be considered like offensive, or the message is offensive. Yeah. Um, but there's also so like in in our world in our timeline Earth. Uh, again we're talking about subversion like a lot of artists will make something that's intentionally unappealing to the human eye as a way to be subversive disney yeah <laughs> <laughs> i wasn't gonna say I that had to throw it in there i'm sorry <laughs> but like you, you know a lot of like expressionist abstract stuff is like yeah it's almost intentional like they want it to be ugly like yeah. that's sort of the point uh, but again like if that is the point does that make the art good because it's doing right. what it set out to do versus but, a painting that was supposed to be let's say true to life but it doesn't capture that yeah. considered bad even if it's you know like you can tell it's a person or a dog or something yeah yeah i don't know uh yeah like the question of i i mean i don't think art is objective but i do think there is art that is like more appealing to the hu- human eye yeah it's than more art aesthetic. yeah <laughs> <laughs> i i do think that that is like hard to get away from you, you can't it i don't know it's a tricky one like i i don't know how you square that circle but like yeah what is objective art but i know i don't know what it is but i do know that there's art that the vast majority of people are going to find ugly you yeah. know and uh, that, that also vice versa that people will find beautiful yeah yeah no that's fair and i i did kind of say it mockingly about the disney <laughs> comment but that is a valid question even now with current disney media coming out people are saying like oh yeah you know it's subjective or it's right. not maybe like the way you like star wars yeah. um i mean uh, what disney is churning out a lot of it well let, like i'll give credit where it's due there's once in a while they get it they they hit a home run right but that's like rare and far between yeah uh pretty rare um but man a lot of the stuff they're churning out just seems like corporate slop you know <laughs> that's exactly what i was gonna say it's like corporate like yeah. consensus based safe 
it, it but it, it's like they're put out, they're not putting out art they're putting out a product yeah is, is what they're doing they've stripped like, away the artistry yeah and now it's devoid of like its essence which yeah, again does. is is the intent behind the art right so like technically a lightsaber looks like a lightsaber a jedi might look like a jedi yeah but the soul of that representation the artistic element is missing yeah which i, I mean think people I, detect and going back to like our our conversation about like subversion like let's take the last jedi for example well that was an intentionally subversive yeah but that that was the whole narrative around the film was that it was subversive right like it's a subversive piece of art but like i said before (laughs) subversion often like they were intentionally making something that's like not appealing to to the human eye right to like subvert your expectation i mean sometimes they were just maybe they thought it was appealing but i think a lot of the uh, art is is just like yeah it's subverting your expectations because it's bad <laughs> like <laughs> yeah I, I, it goes back to the artist's intent yeah um and that being said like i do agree but that can also be done poorly and that goes back to my thing about bad art yeah if your intent is to be subversive okay that's that can be cool that can be interesting but if it's executed poorly then it's still bad yeah right so you can't just hide behind the cloak of like well i meant to you know not give you what you expected yeah um okay but you've done it poorly still so well well, there's also like if you are gonna do something subversive and again i'm not against it being subversive but if you're gonna do it that subversion still has to like clearly communicate the message that you want to get across yeah and with some of these so-called subversive stuff that disney does i'm not even sure like what the point they're trying to do is other than just like the intent isn't even clear. Yeah, other than just to rile up Star Wars fans. On purpose. <laughs> yeah, like rage baiting or something like yeah. that. You know, like I, I don't, I, I honestly, I don't get what they're trying to get across. And that's, that's sometimes the most frustrating part of a lot of like Disney content that comes out is like, it's just, I, I don't understand <laughs> what is going on here. Yeah. <laughs> like, what's the point that you're trying to convey? Yeah. yeah. It, I don't know. It's, uh, yeah. And kind of, c- I didn't mean to turn this into a Disney thing. It just kind of came up since we're naturally talking about art, but, um, hard to avoid. Yeah, that's true. And that's fair. And it it is topical. So, um, another example I was kind of thinking of is like Soviet art, right? Where it was almost like state mandated the style and what you're allowed to express. So there's interesting elements because like Soviet style art, I find interesting in the way it looks now. Yeah, yeah but like back then is it really art if it's like devoid of like it might be technically sound technically sound but like it's just mandated right yeah, like it's just propaganda yeah and artist isn't allowed to actually express anything real through it or at least not anything they are outside of certain strict bounds right yeah. um so yeah just interest like just an interesting thought i had yeah. Also, some of the like, if you guys look online at like imperial propaganda art, it's pretty sweet. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and same point, right? Like, so if an artist like gets the a empire gun, wants you and all that. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Those are pretty. And awesome. again, I'm I'm a fan. I even like the Soviet and the Chinese and Chinese <laughs> style art. Uh, yeah. At least communist Chinese art follows in that same kind of example. And again, like you were saying, like the empire, yeah, does the same thing. And like I said, it's technically sound. Like I can appreciate like how it looks and its own kind of genre of art. But considering the reality of how that art is produced, again, like you're only allowed to do this kind of art and forcing people into this mold, right? Right. And you can only express these ideas that are supportive of the regime. Mm -hmm. So um, whenever I talk about art, something that comes to my mind constantly is the Transformers movie as well is there's a difference between like good art and bad art and then like your preferences. I love the first Transformers movie. I think it's fantastic, but I can appreciate that it's not an artistic film and it's not like um, from a technical point of view, like it's not an Oscar winner or anything like that. It's not fine art. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, the way certain other films might be considered. Um, and that's always just an example I go to. I enjoy that film, but I know what that film is. Yeah, it's sort of low, yeah, low, low art. Yeah. yeah, if even called that, right? Like yeah. it's just yeah, it's hard to say. Again, it, you know, the Transformers movies. 
especially after the first but even the first one to some extent but especially after the first one it feels again very disney it's like very it's yeah just, and i stopped liking them after yeah the first it's one. just they're making a product right like they're, yeah. they're not making they become corporatized yeah and, they're just giving you you know a pepsi can that's that's what they're giving you you know yeah. or an apple computer or something yes yeah. it's, it's just the same thing over and over again yeah and interestingly enough, again, back to Star Wars, it's like you have like Lucas who has an artistic vision and he is an artist at his core, right? Yeah. Um, you know, he might not execute certain elements perfectly, sure. But there's life and soul in what Lucas was at least initially creating, right? Yeah. And then that later on changes. So Absolutely. I think I think there's like a lot of artistic elements in the original and prequel trilogies and I you know we've mentioned it quite a few times on the pod before like how uh how edgy like the Phantom Menace really was like kind of came out at the same time as The Matrix and a couple other films yeah. uh that really hadn't really pushed the bounds in terms of CGI uh to that point and they really did like it doesn't get enough phantom menace really doesn't get enough credit, credit. for yeah. uh how it did push the bounds if maybe it went too far but that is kind of what you do with art right yeah like exactly you, you kind of push the bounds a little bit yeah and you try it and see if it works so yeah no absolutely yeah and even like the artistry like again what i was saying earlier like art can become political or have political messaging in it and that is lucas did that well enough that like the politics are there but also the artistry is there yeah. right it's not just like a sledgehammer of politics smashing in the face absolutely um so yeah there's definitely a lot of artistry and again art of storytelling the art of filmmaking the art of cgi the art it's just this combination the art of music yeah a combination Dance, of all these arts yeah. yeah put together just to make these films so um one kind of last in-universe point I wanted to bring up was a cool concept that can be explored is art that exists outside our, of our ability to understand or comprehend as like human beings limited by our five senses. Um, that is one thing, give credit to Disney, that they kind of explored a little bit um, with the idea that the Force is an art song. So like beings that have connection to the Force can like use it to create artistic impressions, I guess. Um, or other elements that people who are force sensitive, like it means something different to them. They can feel it differently than you and I can. And same with aliens too. There's uh, like the Kaminoans, the way they, their photoreceptors work, everything that looks bright and, and clean and like, uh, like Camino, like just sterile to them is actually quite colorful world that they live in. But we can't perceive it, right? Right, right. So, like, imagine a, a creature that can see in the ultraviolet spectrum and the things that they can create that's artistic in that realm that we yeah. just will never be able to fully appreciate or experience. Totally. Um, and you could do that in, like, a million different ways with all the different species and things that exist in Star Wars. So, Yeah, it I, is, like, a, a question to ask, too. Like, what... If you were, like, a completely different species, how would yeah. you perceive what is artistic? Yeah, theory, and even right? the very, what is beautiful. The very concept yeah. of art, right? Yeah. There might be a species that doesn't even believe art exists. They're very practical. Yeah, And totally. they just do things that have function and no meaning beyond that. Yeah. Yeah, it's... Yeah, it... it uh, again, art is, like, perceived through a very human lens. So we're, we can only speak about it through, like, our biology psychology yeah. culture whatnot um if we're like completely removed from what we are we couldn't perceive it in a different way another um just an excellent sci-fi if anyone ever wants to ch check out is the short story uh the story of your life um also the movie arrival was based off that short story um where it's like a very depiction of an different depiction of an alien species and the way that it communicates sorry spoiler alert but uh, <laughs> the way that it communicates is sort of like these almost ink jots that it like spreads out into the atmosphere and creates and that's like how it communicates right and it's like very artistic and beautiful and and um uh just like strange alien if yeah. you will <laughs> which i actually think arrival has one of the best depictions of like what an alien probably would be like because it's just so re removed from our yeah we yeah. like because if there was an alien it wouldn't be like a bipedal well, hold on. for for a hold on. 
Uh, Maybe not necessarily bipedal and four limbed and you know, yeah, like two a central eyes nervous and a nose. system. Yeah, yeah. Um, I will argue, and I agree with you. I do like kind of more experimental versions of aliens that are like just so beyond our comprehension. Yeah. Um, at the same time, sometimes we we don't know. I know, I know. And there could be there could be a default state that biology kind of slots itself into so a lot of people like a kind of meme joke is that is everything turns into crabs in the end yeah because <laughs> they're like the optimized like biological right, form yeah. <laughs> right so it is entirely possible that you know things i forget uh yeah they, they they evolve convergently yeah there's kind of like a a setting or like environmental factors that create like a specific like vertebrates and yeah exactly carbon-based life forms yeah well, carbon-based life is the first big thing is that like yeah. we don't even think anything else can exist outside of carbon-based life now we could be totally off and like a silica-based life form could but exist that's not, if there was something that wasn't carbon-based life form it would yeah. likely look extremely different different right exactly but we'll then be. when you start slotting into the other possibilities of like okay we're all being shaped by the same forces that yeah. something could theoretically come out some looking like an approximation of us or an animal that we have on earth now that being said we don't know. It could be the complete opposite direction and just be like something so completely alien to us that we yeah. do not understand how it perceives even time and space and reality, right? Like, I, and I take your point for sure. I do take your point. However, I think with a lot of science fiction depictions of alien life forms, there's a lot of assumptions always baked in. Of to, course. To and limitations idea. of technology. <laughs> yeah, Star Trek is a great example. <laughs> yeah. It'll just slap a green paste on their We're, face. And uh, well, uh, if you watch... No. Well, yeah, even mo especially the original series and next gen, like there was just tons of quote unquote alien life forms yeah. that were just humans. There was yeah. like literally no physical difference between them. Yeah. Um. So yeah, it was. Uh, there's like a lot of assumptions baked into the depictions, right? But anyways, uh, yeah, it's I guess interesting how that would relate to art and how we would interpret art and and create art as well. Yeah, so. how a species completely different from the human form might. Totally. Cool. Well, I think uh, that's it. Um, we have a opera to catch. <laughs> <laughs> how about that?